The Great Christian Doctrine of Original Sin Defended by Jonathan Edwards The Author's Preface The following discourse is intended not merely as an answer to any particular book written against the doctrine of original sin, but as a general defense of that great important doctrine. Nevertheless, I have in this defense taken notice of the main thing said against this doctrine by such of the more noted opposers of it, as I have had opportunity to read, particularly those two late writers, Dr. Turnbull and Dr. Taylor of Norwich, but especially the latter, which he has published in those two books of his, the first entitled, The Scripture Doctrine of Original Sin Proposed to Free and Candid Examination, the other, his key to the apostolic writings, with a paraphrase and notes on the Epistle to the Romans. I have closely attended to Dr. Taylor's piece on original sin and all its parts, and have endeavored that no one thing there said, of any consequence in this controversy should pass unnoticed, or that anything which has the appearance of an argument in opposition to this doctrine should be left unanswered. I look on the doctrine as of great importance, which everybody will doubtless own it is if it is true. For if the case be such, indeed, that all mankind are by nature in a state of total ruin, both with respect to the moral evil of which they are subjects and the afflictive evil to which they are exposed, the one is the consequence and punishment of the other, then doubtless the great salvation by Christ stands in direct relation to this ruin as a remedy to the disease. And the whole gospel or doctrine of salvation must suppose it, and all real belief or true notion of that gospel must be built upon it. Therefore, as I think the doctrine is most certainly true and important, I hope my attempting a vindication of it will be candidly interpreted, and that what I have done towards its defense will be impartially considered by all that will give themselves the trouble to read the ensuing discourse, in which it is designed to examine everything material throughout the doctor's whole book, and many things in the other book containing his key and exposition on Romans, is also many things written in opposition to this doctrine by some other modern authors. Moreover, my discourse being not only intended for an answer to Dr. Taylor and other opposers of the doctrine of original sin, but for a general defense of that doctrine, producing the evidence of the truth of the doctrine, as well as answering objections made against it. I hope this attempt of mine will not be thought needless, nor be altogether useless, notwithstanding other publications on the subject. I would also hope that the extensiveness of the plan of the following treatise will excuse the length of it, and that when it is considered how much was absolutely requisite to the full executing of the design formed on such a plan, how much has been written against the doctrine of original sin, and with what possibility, how strong the prejudices of many are in favor of what is said in opposition to this doctrine, and that it cannot be expected anything short of a full consideration of almost every argument advanced by the main opposers, especially by this late and specious writer, Dr. Taylor, will satisfy many readers how much must unavoidably be said in order to a full handling of the arguments in defense of the doctrine and how important a doctrine must be if true. I trust the length of the following discourse will not be thought to exceed what the case really required. However, this must be left to the judgment of the intelligent and candid reader. Stockbridge, May 26, 1757 The Great Christian Doctrine of Original Sin Defended Part 1 Wherein are considered some evidences of original sin from facts and events is founded by observation and experience, together with representations and testimonies of Holy Scripture and the confession and assertion of opposers, chapter 1, the evidence of original sin from what appears in the fact of the sinfulness of mankind, section 1. 
All mankind constantly in all ages, without fail, in any one instance, run into that moral evil, which is in effect their own utter and eternal perdition and a total privation of God's favor and suffering of his vengeance and wrath. By original sin, as the phrase has been most commonly used by divines, is meant to innate sinful depravity of the heart. But when the doctrine of original sin is spoken of, it is vulgarly understood in that latitude which includes not only the depravity of nature, but the imputation of Adam's first sin, or, in other words, the liableness or explosiveness of Adam's posterity in the divine judgment to partake of the punishment of that sin. So far as I know, most of those who have held one of these have maintained the other, and most of those who have opposed one have opposed the other. Both are opposed by the author chiefly intended to in the following discourse in his book Against Original Sin. And it may perhaps appear in our future consideration of the subject that they are closely connected, that the arguments which prove the one establish the other, and that there are no more difficulties attending the allowing of one than the other. I shall in the first place consider this doctrine more especially with regard to the corruption of nature, and as we treat of this, the other will naturally come into consideration, and the prosecution of the discourse is connected with it. As all moral qualities, all principles either of virtue or vice lie in the disposition of the heart, I shall consider whether we have any evidence that the heart of man is naturally of a corrupt an evil disposition. This is strenuously denied by many late writers who are enemies to the doctrine of original sin, and particularly by Dr. Taylor. The way we come by the idea of any such thing as disposition or tendency is by observing what is constant or general in event, especially under a great variety of circumstances, and above all, when the effect or event continues the same, through great and various opposition, much in manifold force and means used to the contrary not prevailing to hinder the effect. I do not know that such a prevalence of effects is denied to be an evidence of prevailing tendency in causes and agents, or that it is expressly denied by the opposers of the doctrine of original sin, that if in the course of events it universally or generally proves that mankind are actually corrupt, this would be an evidence of a prior corrupt propensity in the world of mankind. Whatever may be said by some, which, if taken with its plain consequences, may seem to imply a denial of this, which may be considered afterwards. But by many the fact is denied, that is, it is denied that corruption and moral evil are commonly prevalent in the world. On the contrary, it is insisted on that good preponderates and that virtue has the ascendant. To this, Dr. Turnbull says, quote, With regard to the prevalence of vice in the world, men are apt to let their imagination run out upon all the robberies, piracies, murders, perjuries, frauds, massacres, assassinations they have either heard of or read in history, thence concluding all mankind to be very wicked. As if a court of justice were a proper place to make an estimate of the morals of mankind or an hospital of the healthfulness of a climate. But ought they not to consider that the number of honest citizens and farmers far surpasses that of all sorts of criminals in any state, and that the innocent and kind actions of even criminals themselves surpass their crimes in numbers, that it is a rarity of crimes in comparison of innocent or good actions which engages our attention to them and makes them to be recorded in history, while honest, generous domestic actions are overlooked only because because they are so common, as one great danger or one month's sickness shall become a frequently repeated story during a long life of health and safety, 
Let not the vices of mankind be multiplied or magnified. Let us make a fair estimate of human life and set over against the shocking, the astonishing instances of barbarity and wickedness that have been perpetrated in any age, not only the exceeding generous and brave actions with which history shines, but the prevailing innocency, good nature, industry, felicity, and cheerfulness of the greater part of mankind at all times, and we shall not find reason to cry out, as subjectors against providence do on this occasion, that all men are vastly corrupt, and that there is hardly any such thing as virtue in the world. Upon a fair computation, the fact does indeed come out that very great villainies have been very uncommon in all ages and looked upon as monstrous, so general is the sense and esteem of virtue, in quote. It seems to be with a like view that Dr. Taylor says, quote, We must not take the measure of our health and enjoyments from a laser house, nor of our understanding from bedlam, nor of our morals from a jail, in quote, page 77. With respect to the propriety and pertinence of such representation of things and its forces to the consequence designed, I hope we shall be able to better judge and in some measure to determine whether the natural disposition of the hearts of mankind be corrupt or not when the things which follow have been considered. But for the greater clearness, it may be proper here to premise one consideration that is of great importance in this controversy and is very much overlooked by the opposers of the doctrine of original sin and their disputing against it, that it is to be looked upon as the true tendency of the innate disposition of man's heart, which appears to be its tendency when we consider things as they are in themselves or in their own nature without the interposition of divine grace. Thus, that state of man's nature, that disposition of the mind, is to be looked upon as evil and pernicious, which, as it is in itself, tends to extremely pernicious consequences, and would certainly end therein, were it not that the free mercy and kindness of God interposes to prevent that issue. It would be very strange if any should argue that there is no evil tendency in the case because the mere favor and compassion of the Most High may step in and oppose the tendency and prevent the sad effect. Particularly, if there be anything in the nature of man whereby he has an universal unfailing tendency to that moral evil, which according to the real nature and true demerit of things as they are in themselves implies his utter ruin, that must be looked upon as an evil tendency or propensity. However divine grace may interpose to save him from deserved ruin and to overrule things to an issue contrary to that which they tend to of themselves. Grace is sovereign, exercised according to the good pleasure of God, bringing good out of evil. The effect of it belongs not to the nature of things themselves that otherwise have an ill tendency any more than the remedy belongs to the disease, but it is something altogether independent on it, introduced to oppose the natural tendency and reverse the course of things. But the event to which things tend according to their own demerit and according to divine justice is the event to which they tend in their own nature as Dr. Taylor's own words fully imply, preface to his paraphrase on Romans page 131. God alone, he says, can declare whether he will pardon or punish the ungodliness and unrighteousness of mankind, which is its own nature punishable. Nothing is more precisely according to the truth of things than divine justice. It weighs things in an even balance. It views and estimates things no otherwise than they are truly in their own nature. Therefore, undoubtedly, that which implies a tendency to ruin, according to the estimate of divine justice, does indeed imply such a tendency in its own nature. And when it must be remembered that it is a moral depravity we are speaking of, and therefore when we are considering whether such depravity do not appear by a tendency to a bad effect or issue, it is a moral tendency to such an issue that is a thing to be taken into the account. A moral tendency or influence is by desert, 
Then may it be said, man's nature or state is attended with a pernicious or destructive tendency in a moral sense when it tends to that which deserves misery and destruction. And therefore it equally shows a moral depravity of the nature of mankind in their present state, whether that nature be universally attended with an effectual tendency to destructive vengeance actually executed, or to their deserving misery and ruin, or their just exposedness to destruction, however that fatal consequence may be prevented by grace or whatever the actual event be. One thing more is to be observed here, that the topic mainly insisted on by the opposers of the doctrine of original sin is the justice of God, both in their objections against the imputation of Adam's sin, and also against his being so ordered that man should come into the world with a corrupt and ruined nature without having merited the displeasure of their Creator by any personal fault. But the latter is not repugnant to God's justice. If men actually are born into the world with a tendency to sin, into misery and ruin for their sin, which actually will be the consequence unless mere grace steps in and prevents it. If this be allowed, the argument from justice is given up. For it is to suppose that their liableness to misery and ruin comes in a way of justice, otherwise there would be no need of the interposition of divine grace to save them. Justice alone would be sufficient security if exercised without grace. It is all one in this dispute about what is just and righteous, whether men are born in a miserable state by a tendency to ruin, which actually follows, and that justly, or whether they are born in such a state as tends to a desert of ruin, which might justly follow, and would actually follow did not grace prevent. For the controversy is not what grace will do, but what justice might do. I have been the more particular on this head because it innervates many of the reasonings and conclusions by which Dr. Taylor makes out his scheme, and which he argues from that state which mankind are in by divine grace, yea, which he himself supposes to be by divine grace, and yet not making any allowance for this, he from hence draws conclusions against what others suppose of the deplorable and ruined state mankind are in by the fall. Footnotes. Dr. Taylor often speaks of death and afflictions as coming on Adam's posterity in consequence of his sin, and in pages 20 and 21 and many other places, he supposes that these things come in consequence of his sin, not as a punishment or a calamity, but as a benefit. But in page 23, he supposes those things would be a great calamity and misery if it were not for the resurrection, which resurrection he there and in the following pages and in many other places speaks of as being by Christ, and often speaks of it as being by the grace of God in Christ. Some of his arguments and conclusions to this effect in order to be made good must depend on such a supposition as this, that God's dispensations of grace are rectifications or amendments of his foregoing constitutions and proceedings which were merely legal as though the dispensations of grace which succeed those of mere law implied an acknowledgment that the preceding legal constitution would be unjust if left as it were or at least very hard dealing with mankind, and that the other were of the nature of a satisfaction to his creatures for former injuries or hard treatment. So that put together the injury with the satisfaction, the legal and injurious dispensation taken with the following good dispensation, which our author calls grace, and the unfairness or improper severity of the former, amended by the goodness of the latter, both together made up one righteous dispensation. The reader is desired to bear in mind what I have said concerning the interposition of divine grace, not altering the nature of things as they are in themselves. Accordingly, when I speak of such and such an evil tendency of things belonging to the present nature and state of mankind, understand me to mean their tendency as they are in themselves, abstracted from any consideration of that remedy the sovereign and infinite grace of God has provided, having 
premise these things, I now assert that mankind are all naturally in such a state as is attended without fail, with the consequence or issue, that they universally run themselves into that which is, in effect, their own utter eternal perdition, as being finally accursed of God, and the subjects of this remediless wrath through sin, from which I infer that the natural state of the mind of man is attended with the propensity of nature, which is prevalent and effectual to such an issue, and that therefore their nature is corrupt and depraved with a moral depravity that amounts to and implies their utter undoing. Here I would first consider the truth of the proposition, and then would show the certainty of the consequences which I infer from it. If both can be clearly and certainly proved, then I trust none will deny but that the doctrine of original depravity is evident. And so the falseness of Dr. Taylor's scheme demonstrated, the greatest part of whose book called the Scripture Doctrine of Original Sin and so on is against the doctrine of innate depravity. And in page 107, he speaks of the conveyance of a corrupt and sinful nature to Adam's posterity as a grand point to be proved by the maintainers of the doctrine of the original sin. In order to demonstrate what is asserted in the proposition laid down, there is need only that these two things should be made manifest. One is this fact that all mankind come into the world in such a state as without fail comes to this issue, namely the universal commission of sin, or that everyone who comes to act in the world as a moral agent is, in a greater or less degree, guilty of sin. The other is that all sin deserves and exposes to utter and eternal destruction unto God's wrath and curse, and would end in it were it not for the interposition of divine grace to prevent the effect, both which can be abundantly demonstrated to be agreeable to the word of God and to Dr. Taylor's own doctrine. That every one of mankind, at least such as are capable of acting as moral agents, are guilty of sin, not now taking it for granted that they come guilty into the world, is most clearly and abundantly evident from the Holy Scriptures, 1 Kings 8.46. If any man sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not... Ecclesiastes 7.20 There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Job 9, 2, and 3, I know it is so of a truth. In other words, as Bildad had just before said that God would not cast away a perfect man, and so on, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. To the like purpose, in Psalm 143, 2, Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. So the words of the apostle, in which he has apparent reference to those of the psalmist, Romans 3, 19 and 20, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Galatians 2, 16 1 John 1, 7 to 10. If we walk in the light, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. In this and in innumerable other places, confession and repentance of sin are spoken of as duties proper for all. It's also prayer to God for pardon of sin, also forgiveness of those that injure us from that motive that we hope to be forgiven of God. Universal guilt of sin might also be demonstrated from the appointment and the declared use and end of the ancient sacrifices, and also from the ransom which every one that was numbered in Israel was directed to pay to make atonement for a soul. Exodus 30, 11 and 16. All are represented not only as being sinful, but as having great and manifold iniquity. 
Job 9, 2 and 3, James 3, 1 and 2. There are many scriptures which both declared the universal sinfulness of mankind and also that all sin deserves and justly exposes to everlasting destruction under the wrath and curse of God, and so demonstrate both parts of the proposition I have laid down, to which purpose that passage in Galatians 3.10 is exceeding full. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. How manifestly is it implied in the apostles' meaning here that there is no man but what fails in some instances of doing all things that are written in the book of the law. And therefore, as many as have their dependence on their fulfilling the law are under that curse which is pronounced on them that fell of it. And hence the apostle infers in the next verse that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, as he has said before in the preceding chapter, verse 16, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The apostle shows us he understands that by this place which he cites from Deuteronomy, the scripture has concluded or shut up all under sin, Galatians 3.22. So that here we are plainly taught both that every one of mankind is a sinner and that every sinner is under the curse of God. To the like purpose is Romans 4:14, 4, also 2 Corinthians 3:6, 7 and 9, where the law is called the letter that kills, the ministration of death, and the ministration of condemnation, the wrath, condemnation, and death, which is threatened in the law to all his transgressors, is finally perdition, the second death eternal ruin, as is very plain and indeed is confessed. And this punishment which the law threatens for every sin is a just punishment, being what every sin truly deserves, God's law being a righteous law, and the sentence of it a righteous sentence. All these things are what Dr. Taylor himself confesses and asserts. He says that the law of God requires perfect obedience. Notes on Romans 7, 6, page 308. God can never require imperfect obedience, or by his holy law allow us to be guilty of any one sin, how small soever. And if the law is a rule of duty, were in any respect abolished, then we might in some respects transgress the law and yet not be guilty of sin. The moral law, or law of nature, is the truth everlasting, unchangeable, and therefore as such can never be abrogated. On the contrary, our Lord Jesus Christ has promulgated it anew under the gospel, fuller and clearer than it was in the Mosaic Constitution or anywhere else, having added to its precepts the sanction of his own divine authority. And many things which he says imply that all mankind do in some degree transgress the law. In page 228, speaking of what may be gathered from Romans 7 and 8, he says, We are very apt in a world full of temptation to be deceived and drawn into sin by bodily appetites and so on. In the case of those who are under a law threatening death to every sin must be quite deplorable if they have no relief from the mercy of the lawgiver. But this is very fully declared in what he says in his notes on Romans 5.20, page 297. His words are as follows, quote, Indeed, as a rule of action prescribing our duty, it, the law, always was and always must be a rule ordained for obtaining life, but not as a rule of justification, not as it subjects to death for every transgression. For if it could, in its utmost rigor, have given us life, then, as the Apostle argues, it would have been against the promises of God. For if there had been a law, in the strict and rigorous sense of law, which could have made us live, verily justification should have been by the law. But he supposes no such law was ever given, and therefore there is need and room enough for the promises of grace, or as he 
argues, Galatians 2.21, it would have frustrated or rendered useless the grace of God. For if justification came by the law, then Christ truly died in vain. Then he died to accomplish what was or might have been affected by law itself without his death. Certainly the law was not brought in among the Jews to be a rule of justification or to recover them out of a state of death or to procure life by their sinless obedience to it. For in this, as well as in another respect, it was weak, not in itself, but through the weakness of our flesh, Romans 8, 3. The law, I conceive, is not a dispensation suitable to the infirmity of the human nature in our present state, or it does not seem congruous to the goodness of God to afford us no other way of salvation but by law, which if we once transgress, we are ruined forever. For who then, from the beginning of the world, could be saved? End quote. How clear and express are these things that no one of mankind from the beginning of the world can ever be justified by law because of every one transgresses it. I am sensible these things are quite inconsistent with what he says elsewhere. A sufficient power in all mankind constantly to do the whole duty which God requires of them without a necessity of breaking God's law in any degree. But I hope the reader will not think me accountable for his inconsistencies. And here also we see Dr. Taylor declares that by the law men are sentenced to everlasting ruin for one transgression. To the like purpose he often expresses himself. So, page 207, quote, The law requires the most extensive obedience, discovering sin in all its branches. It gives sin a deadly force, subjecting every transgression to the penalty of death, and yet supplies neither help nor hope of the sinner, but leaving him under the power of sin and the sentence of death. End quote. In page 213, he speaks of the law as extending to lust and irregular desires and to every branch and principle of sin, and even to its latent principles and minutest branches. Again, and when he speaks of the law subjecting every transgression to the penalty of death, he means eternal death, as he from time to time explains the matter. In page 212, he speaks of the law and the condemning power of it as binding us in everlasting chains. In page 120, S, he says that death, which is the wages of sin, is the second death, and this, page 78, he explains the final perdition. In his key, he says, the curse of the law subjected men for every transgression to eternal death. So in his notes on Romans 5.20, the law of Moses subjected those who were under it to death, meaning by death, eternal death. These are his words. He also supposes that the sentence of the law thus subjected men for every, even the least sin, and every minutest branch and latent principle of sin, to so dreadful a punishment as just and righteous, agreeable to truth, and the nature of things, or to the natural and proper demerits of sin. In this he is very full. Thus on page 186, quote, It was sin, he says, which subjected us to death by the law, justly threatening sin with death, which law was given us that sin might appear, might be set forth in its proper colors, when we saw it subjected us to death, by a law perfectly holy, just, and good. This sin by the commandment by the law might be represented what it is really an exceeding great and deadly evil, end quote. So in notes on Romans 5.20, quote, The law or ministration of death, as it subjects to death for every transgression, is still of use to show the natural and proper demerit of sin, end quote. And page 298, quote, The law was added, saith Mr. Locke, on the place, because the law, the Israelites, the posterity of Abraham, were transgressors as well as other men, to show, to show them their sins and the punishment and death, which in strict justice they incurred by them. And this appears to be a true comment on Romans 7.13. Sin, by virtue of the law, subjected you to death for this end, that sin working death in us by that which is holy, just, and good, 
perfectly consonant to everlasting truth and righteousness. Consequently, every sin is in strict justice deserving of wrath and punishment, and the law in its rigor was given to the Jews to set home this awful truth upon their consciences to show them the evil and pernicious nature of sin. And that being conscious they had broke the law of God, this might convince them of the great need they had of the favor of the lawgiver and oblige them by faith and his goodness to fly to his mercy for pardon and salvation. In quote. If the law be holy, just, and good, a constitution perfectly agreeable to God's holiness, justice, and goodness, then he might have put it exactly in execution, agreeably to all these his perfections. Our author himself says, on page 133, quote, how that constitution which establishes a law, the making of which is inconsistent with the justice and goodness of God, and the executing of it inconsistent with His holiness, can be a righteous constitution, I confess is quite beyond my comprehension." End quote. Now the reader is left to judge whether it be not most plainly and fully agreeable to Dr. Taylor's own doctrine that there never was any one person from the beginning of the world who came to act in the world as a moral agent, and that it is not to be hoped there ever will be any, but what is a sinner or transgressor of the law of God, and that therefore this proves to be the issue and event of things with respect to all mankind in all ages, that by the natural and proper demerit of their own sinfulness, and in the judgment of the law of God, which is perfectly consonant to truth and exhibits things in their true colors, they are the proper subjects of the curse of God, eternal death, and everlasting ruin, which must be the actual consequence unless the grace or favor of the lawgiver interpose and mercy prevail for their pardon and salvation. The reader has seen also how agreeable this is to the doctrine of the Holy Scripture. If so, and if the interposition of divine grace alters not the nature of things as they are in themselves, and that it does not in the least affect the state of the controversy we are upon, concerning the true nature of and tendency of the state in which mankind come into the world, whether grace prevents a fatal effect or no, I trust none will deny that the proposition laid down is fully proved as agreeable to the Word of God and Dr. Taylor's own words, namely, the mankind are all naturally in such a state as is attended without fail with this consequence or issue that they universally are the subjects of that guilt and sinfulness which is in effect their utter and eternal ruin being cast wholly out of the favor of God and subjected to his everlasting wrath and curse. Section 2 It follows from the proposition proved in the foregoing section that all mankind are under the influence of a prevailing effectual tendency in their nature to that sin and wickedness which implies their utter and eternal ruin. The proposition laid down the improved the consequence of it remains to be made out, namely, that the mind of man has a natural tendency or propensity to that event, which has been shown universally and infallibly to take place, and that this is a corrupt or depraved propensity. I shall here consider the former part of this consequence, namely, whether such an universal constant infallible event is truly a proof of any tendency or propensity to that event, leaving the evil and corrupt nature of such a propensity to be considered afterwards. If any should say they do not think that as being a thing universal and infallible in event, that mankind commits some sin, is a proof of a prevailing tendency to sin, because they do good, and perhaps more good than evil, let them remember that the question at present is not how much sin there is a tendency to, but whether there be a prevailing propensity to that issue, which it is allowed all men to actually come to, that all fell of keeping the law perfectly, 
whether there be not a tendency to such imperfection of obedience as always without fail comes to pass, to that degree of sinfulness, at least, which all fall into, and so to that utter ruin which that sinfulness implies and infers, whether an effectual propensity to this be worth the name of depravity, because the good that may be supposed to balance it shall be considered by and by. If all mankind in all nations and ages were at least one day in their lives deprived of the use of their reason and raving mad, or that all, even every individual person, once cut their own throats or put out their own eyes, it might be an evidence of some tendency in the nature or natural state of mankind to such an event. Though they might exercise reason many more days than they were distracted, and were kind to and tender of themselves oftener than they mortally and cruelly wounded themselves, to determine whether the unfailing constancy of the above-named event be an evidence of tendency, let it be considered what can be meant by tendency but a prevailing liableness or exposedness to such or such an event wherein consists the notion of any such thing, but some stated prevalence or preponderation in the nature or state of causes or occasions that is followed by and so proves to be effectual to a stated prevalence or commonness of any particular kind of effect, or something in the permanent state of things concerned in bringing a certain sort of event to pass, which is a foundation for the constancy or strongly prevailing probability of such an event. If we mean this by tendency, and I know not what else can be meant by it, but this or something like, then it is manifest that where we see a stated prevalence of any effect, there is a tendency to that effect in the nature and state of its causes. A common and steady effect shows that there is somewhere a preponderation, a prevailing exposedness or liableness in the state of things to what comes so steadily to pass. The natural dictate of reason shows that where there is an effect, there is a cause, and a cause sufficient for the effect, because if it were not sufficient, it would not be effectual, and that, therefore, where there is a stated prevalence of the effect, there is a stated prevalence in the cause. A stated effect argues a steady cause. We obtain a notion of tendency no other way than by observation, and we can observe nothing but events, and it is the commonness or constancy of events that gives us a notion of tendency in all cases. Thus we judge of tendencies in the natural world. Thus we judge of the tendencies or propensities of nature in minerals, vegetables, animals, rational and irrational creatures. A notion of a stated tendency or a fixed propensity is not obtained by observing only a single event. A stated preponderation in the cause or occasion is argued only by a stated prevalence of the effect. If a die be once thrown and it falls on a particular side, we do not argue from hence that that side is the heaviest, but if it be thrown without skill or care many thousands or millions of times, and it constantly falls on the same side, we have not the least doubt in our minds, but that there is something of propensity in the case by superior weight of that side or in some other respect. How ridiculous would he make himself who should earnestly dispute against any tendency in the state of things to cold in the winter or heat in the summer, or should stand to it that though, although it often happened that water quenched fire, yet there was no tendency in it to such an effect. In a case we are upon human nature is existing in such an immense diversity of persons and circumstances and never failing in any one instance of coming to that issue that sinfulness which implies extreme misery and eternal ruin is as a die often cast for it alters not the subject of the constant event being individual or a nature in kind
Thus, if there be a succession of trees of the same sort, proceeding one from another, from the beginning of the world, growing in all countries, soils, and climates, all bearing ill fruit, it as much proves the nature and tendency of the kind, as if it were only one individual tree that had remained from the beginning of the world, often transplanted into different soils, and had continued to bear only bad fruit. So if there were a particular family from which which from generation to generation and through every remove to innumerable different countries and places of abode all died of a consumption or all run distracted or all murdered themselves it would be as much an evidence of the tendency of something in the nature or constitution of that race as it would be of the tendency of something in the nature or state of an individual if some one person had lived all that time, and some remarkable event had often appeared in him which he had been the agent or subject of from year to year and from age to age, continually and without fail. Thus a propensity attending the present nature or natural state of mankind, eternally to ruin themselves by sin, may certainly be inferred from apparent and acknowledged fact. And I would now observe further that not only does this follow from facts acknowledged by Dr. Taylor, but the things he asserts in the expressions which he uses plainly imply that all mankind have such a propensity, yea, one of the highest kind, a propensity that is invincible, or a tendency which really amounts to a fixed, constant, unfailing necessity. There is a plain confession of a propensity or proneness to sin. On page 143, quote, Man who drinketh in iniquity like water, who is attended with so many sensual appetites and so apt to indulge them, end quote. And again, page 228, quote, We are very apt in a world full of temptation to be deceived and drawn into sin by bodily appetites, end quote. If we were very apt or prone to be drawn into sin by bodily appetites and sinfully to indulge them, and very apt or prone to yield temptation to sin, then we are prone to sin, for to yield to temptation to sin is sinful. In the same page he shows that on this account and its consequences, the case of those who are under a law threatening death for every sin must be quite deplorable if they have no relief from the mercy of the lawgiver, which implies that their case is hopeless as to an escape from death, the punishment of sin by any other means than God's mercy, and that implies such an aptness to yield to temptation as renders it hopeless that any of mankind should wholly avoid it. But he speaks of it elsewhere, over and over, as truly impossible, or what cannot be, as in the words before cited in the last section from his note on Romans 5.20, where he repeatedly speaks of the law, which subjects us to death for every transgression, as what cannot give life, and states that if God offered us no other way of salvation, no man from the beginning of the world could be saved. In the same place he cites with approbation John Locke's words in which, speaking of the Israelites, he says, quote, All endeavors after righteousness was lost labor, since any one slip forfeited life, and it was impossible for them to expect aught but death, end quote. Our author speaks of it as impossible for the law requiring sinless obedience to give life, not that the law was weak in itself, but through the weakness of our flesh. Therefore, he says, he conceives the law not to be a dissipation suitable to the infirmity of the human nature in its present state. These things amount to a full confession that the proneness in men to sin and to a demerit of and just exposedness to eternal ruin is universal invincible, or which is the same thing, amounts to invincible necessity, which surely is the highest kind of tendency or propensity, and that not the less for his laying this propensity to our infirmity or weakness, which may seem to intimate some defect rather than anything positive. <clears throat> 
and it is agreeable to the sentiments of the best divines that all sin originally comes from a defective or privative cause. But sin does not cease to be sin, justly exposing to eternal ruin, as implied in Dr. T's own words, for arising from infirmity or defect. Nor does an invincible propensity to sin cease to be a propensity to such the merit of eternal ruin, because the proneness arises from such a cause. It is manifest that this tendency which has been proved does not consist in any particular external circumstances that persons are in, peculiarly influencing their minds, but is inherent and is seated in that nature which is common to all mankind, which they carry with them wherever they go, and still remains the same however circumstances may differ. For it is implied in what has been proved and shown to be confessed that the same event comes to pass in all circumstances. In God's sight, no man living can be justified, but all are sinners and exposed to condemnation. This is true of persons of all constitutions, capacities, conditions, manners, opinions, and educations, in all countries, climates, nations, and ages, and through all the mighty changes and revolutions which have come to pass in the habitable world. We have the same evidence that the propensity in this case lies in the nature of the subject and does not arise from any particular circumstances as we have in any case whatsoever, which is only by the effects appearing to be the same in all changes of time and place and under all varieties of circumstances. It is in this way only we judge that any propensities which we observe in all mankind are seated in their nature. In all other cases, it is thus we judge of the mutual propensity betwixt the sexes, or of the dispositions which are exercised in any of the natural passions or appetites, that they truly belong to the nature of man, because they are observed in mankind in general, through all countries, nations, and ages, and in all conditions. If any should say, though it be evident that there is a tendency in the state of things to this general event, that all mankind should fill a perfect obedience and should sin and incur a demerit of eternal ruin, and also that this tendency does not lie in any distinguishing circumstances of any particular people, person, or age, yet it may not lie in man's nature, but in the general constitution and frame of this world. Though the nature of man may be good without any evil propensity inherent in it, yet the nature and universal state of this world may be full of so many and strong temptations, and of such powerful influence on such a creature as man, dwelling in so infirm a body, and so on, that the result of the whole may be a strong and infallible tendency in such a state of things to the sin and eternal ruin of every one of mankind." To this I would reply that such an evasion will not at all avail to the purpose of those whom I oppose in this controversy. It alters not the cases to this question whether man in his present state is depraved and ruined by propensities to sin. If any creature be of such a nature that it proves evil in its proper place or in the situation which God has assigned it in the universe, it is of an evil nature. That part of the system is not good which is not good in its place in the system, and those inherent qualities of that part of the system which are not good but corrupt in that place are justly looked upon as evil inherent qualities. That propensity is truly esteemed to belong to the nature of any being or to be inherent in it. That is a necessary consequence of its nature, considered together with its proper situation in the universal system of existence, whether that propensity be good or bad. It is the nature of a stone to be heavy, but yet if it were placed, as it might be, at a distance from this world, it would have no such quality. 
but being a stone is of such a nature that it will have this quality or tendency in its proper place in this world where God has made it. It is properly looked upon as a propensity belonging to its nature. And if it be a good propensity here in its proper place, then it is a good quality of its nature. But if it be contrarywise, it is an evil natural quality. So if mankind are of such a nature that they have an universal effectual tendency to sin and ruin in this world, where God has made and placed them, this is to be looked upon as a pernicious tendency belonging to their nature. There is perhaps scarce any such thing in beings not independent and self-existent as any power or tendency, but what has some dependence on other beings with which they stand connected in the universal system of existence. Propensities or are no propensities any otherwise than is taken with their objects. Thus it is with the tendencies observed in natural bodies such as gravity, magnetism, electricity, and so on. And thus it is with the propensities observed in the various kinds of animals, and thus it is with most of the propensities in created spirits. It may further be observed that it is exactly the same thing as to the controversy concerning an agreeableness with God's moral perfection to such a disposal of things. The man should come into the world in a depraved and ruined state by a propensity to sin and ruin. Whether God has so ordained it that this propensity should lie in his na nature considered alone or with relation to its situation in the universe and its connection with other parts of the system to which the Creator has united it, which is as much of God's ordering as man's nature itself, most simply considered. Dr. Taylor, speaking of the attempt of some to solve the difficulty of God being the author of our nature, and yet that our nature is polluted, by supposing that God makes a soul pure, but unites it to a polluted body, or a body so made as tends to pollute the soul, he cries out of it as weak and insufficient and too gross to be admitted. For, he says, who infused a soul into the body? And if it is polluted by being infused into the body, who is the author and cause of its pollution? And who created the body? And so on. But is not the case just the same as to those who suppose that God made the soul pure and places it in a polluted world, or a world tending by its natural state in which it is made to pollute the soul, or to have such an influence upon it that it shall without fail be polluted with sin and eternally ruin? Here may not I also cry out on as good a grounds as Dr. Taylor, who placed the soul here in this world, and if the world be polluted, or so constituted as naturally and infallibly to pollute the soul with sin, who is the cause of this pollution, and, and who created the world? Though in the place now cited, Dr. Taylor so insists upon it that God must be answerable for the pollution of the soul if he has infused or put the soul into a body that tends to pollute it, yet this is the very thing which he himself supposes to be the fact with respect to the soul being created by God in such a body and in such a world, where he says, quote, We are apt in a world full of temptations to be drawn into sin by bodily appetites, end quote. And if so, according to his way of reasoning, God must be the author and cause of this aptness to be drawn into sin. Again, page 143, we have these words, quote, Who drinketh in iniquity like water, who is attended with so many sensual appetites, and so apt to indulge them, end quote. In these words, our author, in effect, says the individual things that he exclaims against as so gross, namely, the tendency of the body, as God has made it, to pollute the soul, which he has infused into it. The essential appetites which incline the soul or make it apt to a sinful indulgence are either from the body which God has made, or otherwise a proneness to sinful indulgence is immediately and originally seated in the soul itself, which will not mend the matter. I would lastly observe that our author insists upon it, page 42, that this lower world in its present state, quote, is as it was when upon a review God pronounced it in all its furniture very good, 
and that the present form and furniture of the earth is full of God's riches, mercy, and goodness, and of the most evident tokens of his love and bounty to the inhabitants, and quote. If so, there can be no room for evading the evidences from fact of the universal infallible tendency of man's nature to sin and eternal perdition, since on the supposition the tendency to this issue does not lie in the general constitution and frame of this world, which God has made to be the habitation of mankind. On Original Sin, Section 3. That propensity which has been proved to be in the nature of all mankind must be a very evil, depraved, and pernicious propensity, making it manifest that the soul of man, as it is by nature, is in a corrupt, fallen, and ruined state, which is the other part of the consequence drawn from the proposition laid down in the first section. The question to be considered in order to determine whether man's nature be depraved and ruined is not whether he is inclined to perform as many good deeds as bad ones, but to which of these two he preponderates in the frame of his heart, in a state of his nature, a state of innocence and righteousness in favor with God, or a state of sin, guiltiness and abhorrence in the sight of God, persevering sinless righteousness, or else the guilt of sin is the alternative on the decision of which depends according to the nature and truth of things, as they are in themselves, and according to the rule of right and of perfect justice, man being approved and accepted of his Maker, and eternally blessed as good, or his being rejected and cursed as bad. And therefore the determination of the tendency of man's heart and nature with respect to these terms is that which is to be looked at in order to determine whether his nature is good or evil, pure or corrupt, sound or ruin. If such be man's nature in the state of his heart, that he has an infallibly effectual propensity to the latter of those terms, then it is wholly impertinent to talk of the innocent and kind actions, even of criminals themselves, surpassing their crimes in numbers, and of the prevailing innocence, good nature, industry, felicity, and cheerfulness of the greater part of mankind. Let never so many thousands or millions of acts of honesty, good nature, and so on be supposed. Yet by the supposition there is an unfailing propensity to such moral evil, as in its dreadful consequences infinitely outweighs all effects or consequences of any supposed good. Surely that tendency, which in effect is an infallible tendency to eternal destruction, is an infinitely dreadful and pernicious tendency, and that nature and frame of mind which implies such a tendency must be an infinitely dreadful and pernicious frame of mind. It would be much more absurd to suppose that such a state of nature is not bad, under a notion of men doing more honest and kind things than evil ones, than to say the state of that ship is good for crossing the Atlantic Ocean, though such as cannot hold together through the voyage, but will infallibly founder and sink, under a notion that it may probably go a great part of the way before it sinks, or that it will proceed and sail above water more hours than it will be in sinking, or to pronounce that road a good road to go to such a place, a greater part of which is plain and safe, though some parts of it are dangerous and certainly fatal, to them that travel in it, or to call that a good propensity which is an inflexible inclination to travel in such a way. A propensity to that sin which brings God's eternal wrath and curse, which has been proved to belong to the nature of man as evil, not only as it is a calamitous and sorrowful ending in great natural evil, but as it is odious and detestable, for by the supposition it tends to that moral evil, by which the subject becomes odious in the sight of God, and liable as such to be condemned and utterly rejected and cursed by him. This also makes it evident that the state which it has been proved mankind are in 
is a corrupt state in a moral sense, that it is inconsistent with the fulfillment of the law of God, which is a rule of moral rectitude and goodness, that tendency which is opposite to what the moral law requires and prone to that which the moral law utterly forbids and eternally condemns is doubtless a corrupt tendency in a moral sense. So that this depravity is both odious and also pernicious, fatal and destructive, in the highest sense, as inevitably tending to that which implies man's eternal ruin. It shows that man, as he is by nature, is in a deplorable state in the highest sense. And this proves that men do not come into the world perfectly innocent in the sight of God and without any just exposedness to his displeasure. For the being by nature in a lost and ruined state, in the highest sense, is not consistent with being by nature in a state of favor with God. But if any should still insist on the notion of men's good deeds exceeding their bad ones, and that seeing the good more than countervails the evil, they cannot be properly denominated evil, all persons and things being most properly denominated from that which prevails, and has the ascendant in them. I would say further that if there is in man's nature a tendency to guilt and ill desert, and a vast overbalance to virtue and merit, or a propensity to sin, the demerit of which is so great that the value and merit of all the virtuous acts that ever he performs are as nothing to it, then truly the nature of man may be said to be corrupt and evil. That this is a true case may be demonstrated by what is evident by the infinite heinousness of sin against God from the nature of things. The heinousness of this must rise in some proportion to the obligation we are under to regard the divine being, and that must be in some proportion to his worthiness of regard, which doubtless is infinitely beyond the worthiness of any of our fellow creatures. But the merit of our respect or obedience to God is not infinite. The merit of respect to any being does not increase, but it is rather diminished in proportion to the obligations we are under in strict justice to pay him that respect. There is no great merit in paying a debt we owe, and by the highest possible obligations in strict justice are obliged to pay, but there is great demerit in refusing to pay it that on such a accounts as these there is an infinite demerit in all sin against God, which must therefore immensely outweigh all the merit which can be supposed to be in our virtue, I think is capable of full demonstration, and that the futility of the objections which some have made against the argument might most plainly be demonstrated. But I shall omit a particular consideration of the evidence of this matter from the nature of things, as I study brevity, and lest any should cry out metaphysics, as a manner of some is, when any argument is handled against a tenet they are fond of, with a close and exact consideration of the nature of things. And this is not so necessary in the present case, inasmuch as a point asserted that he who commits any one sin has guilt and ill desert so great that the value and merit of all the good which it is possible he should do in his whole life is as nothing to it, is not only evident by metaphysics, but is plainly demonstrated by what has been shown to be fact with respect to God's own constitutions and dispensations towards mankind. Thus, whatever acts of virtue and obedience a man performs, yet if he trespasses in one point, is guilty of any the least sin, he according to the law of God, and so according to the exact truth of things and the proper demerit of sin, is exposed to be wholly cast out of favor with God, and subjected to his curse to be utterly and eternally destroyed. This has been proved and shown to be the doctrine which Dr. Taylor abundantly teaches. But how can it be agreeable to the nature of things, and exactly consonant to everlasting truth and righteousness, thus to deal with the creature for the least sinful act, though he should perform ever so many thousands of honest and virtuous acts to countervail the evil of that sin?' 
Or how can it be agreeable to the exact truth and real the merit of things, thus wholly to cast off the deficient creature without any regard to the merit of all his good deeds, unless that be in truth the case that the value and merit of all those good actions bear no proportion to the heinousness of the least sin? If it were not so, one would think that however the offending person might have some proper punishment, yet seeing there is so much virtue to lay in the balance against the guilt, it would be agreeable to the nature of things that he should find some favor and not be altogether rejected and made the subject of perfect and eternal destruction, and thus no account at all be made of all of its virtue, so much as to procure him the least relief or hope. How can such a constitution represent sin in its proper colors and according to its true nature and desert, as Dr. Taylor says it does, unless it be, this be its true nature, that it is so bad that even in the least instance it perfectly swallows up all the value of the sinner's supposed good deeds, let them be ever so many, so that this matter is not left to our metaphysics or philosophy, the great lawgiver and infallible judge of the universe has clearly decided it in the revelation he has made of what is agreeable to exact truth, justice, and the nature of things in his revealed law or rule of righteousness. He that in any respect or degree is a transgressor of God's law is a wicked man, yea, wholly wicked in the eye of the law, all his goodness being esteemed nothing, having no account made of it when taken together with his wickedness, and therefore without any regard to his righteousness he is by the sentence of the law, and so by the voice of truth and justice to be treated as worthy to be rejected, abhorred, and cursed forever, and must be so unless grace interposed to cover his transgression. But men are really in themselves what they are in the eyes of the law, and by the voice of strict equity and justice, however they may be looked upon and treated by infinite and un merited mercy, so that on the whole it appears all mankind have an infallibly effectual propensity to that moral evil, which infinitely outweighs the value of all the good that can be in them, and have such a disposition of heart that the certain consequence of it is, there being in the eye of perfect truth and righteousness, wicked men. And I leave all to judge whether such a disposition be not in the eye of truth a depraved disposition. Agreeable to these things, as Scripture represents all mankind, not only as having guilt, but immense guilt, which they can have no merit or worthiness to countervail. Such is a representation we have in Matthew 18:21 to the end. There on Peter's inquiring how often his brother should trespass against him, and he forgive him, whether until seven times, Christ replies, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven, apparently meaning that he should esteem no number of offenses too many, and no degree of injury it is possible our neighbor should be guilty of towards us too great to be forgiven. For which this reason is given in the parable following, that if ever we obtain forgiveness and favor with God, he must pardon that guilt and injury towards his majesty, which is immensely greater than the greatest injuries that ever men are guilty of one towards another. Yea, then the sum of all their injuries put together, let them be ever so many and ever so great, so that the latter would be but an hundred pence to ten thousand talents, which immense debt we owe to God, and have nothing to pay, which implies that we have no merit to countervail any part of our guilt. Therefore, how absurd must it be for Christians to object against the depravity of man's nature, a greater number of innocent and kind actions than of crimes, and to talk of a prevailing innocency, good nature, industry, and cheerfulness of the greater part of mankind. Infinitely more absurd than it would be to insist that the domestic of a prince was not a bad servant, because though sometimes he contemned and affronted his master to a great degree, yet he did not spit in his master's face so often as he performed acts of service. More absurd than it would be to affirm that his spouse was a good wife to him, because although she committed adultery, and that with the slaves and scoundrels sometimes, yet she did not do this so often as she did the duties of a wife. These notions would be absurd, because the crimes are too heinous to be atoned for, 
by many honest actions of the servant or spouse of the prince, there being a vast disproportion between the merit of the one and the ill desert of the other. Thus I have gone through with my first argument, having shown the evidence of the truth of the proposition laid down at first and proved its consequence. <laughs>